to be a little bit overwhelmed by JavaScript. My first very official lecture. <laughs> probably going to be referencing a lot of notes because there's a lot of stuff in here and we're probably going to go over time. And maybe need two lectures or like a break. But anyways, you guys did 35 JavaScript labs this weekend. We, we pretend you did. We pretend. So I want to ask you guys, what was weird about JavaScript? What was weird is, um, it's, it's uh, going back to JavaScript, it's, it's like you're not talking to the computer anymore. It's weird. Really Why? I got too used to the Uzi, Uzi, Ruby, the Ruby, um, like semantics of like, like sort of when, like, like talking directly to the computer. It's more direct, like sentences, I guess. Mm. So I guess syntax. It's more readable. Less readable in JavaScript. What else? There's so many different options for like even just declaring variables in JavaScript. Like, yeah, and what are those? What are the options? Var, uh, var, var, let, and const. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, yeah. So variable declaration. Yeah, right, right. What else? Remember, there's a lot less implicit stuff you have to declare like everything. Yeah, so yeah. more explicit. Yeah. Sometimes I need to over here. Most of the time, you can leave them out Except because like, sometimes you can't. <laughs> there are times where you can't, but it's very rare. Like I've become lazier as I've been working in JavaScript, and I just leave out my semicolons left and right, and it's usually not an issue. The only time I've discovered it to be an issue is when you have an array on the next line and you didn't include a semicolon on the previous line. That's when your code will break. Is there is there like a best practice? Uh, it's recommended to use semicolons as you're starting out so that you kind of like learn that you need to use them and this is what's going on. It's like ending a sentence basically. But as you get better and you know where the semicolons should go, you can leave them out. And like JavaScript will read through your code and it'll like implicitly know where the semicolons should be. What else? So like comparisons, you have to be very strict with this. Like you have to use like three signs. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you will mess it. this up. Yeah. <laughs> you will forget. So use three equal signs. Okay. What else? Hoisting. Hoisting. Hell yeah. What is hoisting? Uh, like how JavaScript makes multiple passes. Mm -hmm. uh, like the first pass is like creeps the memory, stores the variables. Mm -hmm. and the second pass actually executes it there. So like you can actually call the functions before you define it. Yeah, it's pretty cool actually. And with like variables, as you go, as your JavaScript runs through the code, it's going to declare the variables but not assign them, especially oh, yeah. if you use var. So that's something to pay attention to. All right. So I mean, history of JavaScript we can skip, right? Yeah. Yeah. Basically, yeah. in 30 seconds, there were some browser wars. Netscape became big. Mark Anderson wanted <laughs> to have a more like like a DOM that you can manipulate and interact with the web. Like when I first started learning JavaScript, I learned that the internet was basically invented so that researchers can share their research and it was supposed to be these static web pages. And then we wanted like dynamic web pages, so JavaScript. And it was built in 10 days. And it wasn't really respected at first, but then like more and more versions came out, so it became better and better and it's like the only thing that you can use in your browser. Because it would be very difficult for someone to just write a new language that would gain popularity that you can use in your browser. And that would be cross-compatible across multiple browsers. So that's where we get into browser compatibility. Where if we go here, and this is just, oh yay, it's done processing the Heroku video. That's just now on, on your curriculum. <laughs> okay, so if we go here, you can actually see which JavaScript features are compatible with which browsers. So CH is for Chrome, and that's why we like to use Chrome. And things like Internet Explorer are dying out, <laughs> and a lot of things you can't use. I think so. Yeah, it could be. But anyways, that's why we need to use transpilers, because as new features of JavaScript come out every year, 
like developers want to develop in the most convenient way. So like every year JavaScript releases a new version of like what they call ECMAScript. So right now the most popular one is ES6. And before that we had ES5 and still a lot of browsers are not 100 support percent supporting ES6. Most of them are, but maybe some of the older ones might not be, which is why we need to like transpile our code into ES5. But that's not something you have to worry about. That's something like your application can do in the background, like how you didn't have to create every single file in your Ruby apps. There was like stuff going on in the background. So this is just like for your knowledge. There's something called Babel that can transpile new JavaScript into old JavaScript. Especially now like ES7 features are coming out and like developers want to develop with the latest things, but you don't want to have to worry about what your browser can and can't handle. So if you check out Babel, you can write some new JavaScript and it'll turn it into ES5 for you. So if I use const and I put an array, one, two, three, four, five. It turns it into var because that's ES5. If I put a dot filter on it and I do the fancy arrow notation and I turn each element so I get just the odds using fancy arrow notation, it turns it into ES5. So, like the older version. Hell yeah, with colons. So you can just, you can play around with this. You can check it out. So that's Babel. And then getting into the request response cycle, do you guys remember what happens when you go to a website? Like, what's the request response cycle? So you send a get request and then it has to send it back to you. Right, so there's one response per request. So you make a request to a website like you want to see GitHub, for example. No, no, no. It's, yeah, so you get a response where it returns to you either HTML in most situations, sometimes JSON, like if you're making a request to an API, things like that. So that's the request response cycle. It's pretty much the same, but there's more stuff going on with JavaScript. So if you open your tools and you look under your network tab, and I refresh this, you're going to see all these requests coming in. Where are we at? So this is all of like the website is making extra requests in the background to serve up more assets and more information for you. And some of them are JavaScript, which means that JavaScript is running in the browser. And you can't do that with Ruby. So like with Ruby, if you write ERB, you can't write ERB in the browser. So let me just give you an example. <coughs> I'm going to pull up an old Rails project from one of the labs in Mod 2. Let's see. I had a good one here. Crud with validations. And we'll start a server. And we'll open the old project. So if you look at this form, it's all in ERB, right? But what are we going to see in the browser if we inspect these elements? HTML. Yeah. So what ends up happening is it's actually compiled server side and churned into pure HTML before it's even on the browser side. Oh, Siri, go away. Every day this happens. Why is my local host not working? Colons are important, guys, right? Right, so none of this is ERB. It's just pure HTML. 
But with JavaScript, you actually can put JavaScript in the browser, and it's really cool. So for example, there's a console here, and I can do stuff like <coughs> and now I have made all the content on this page editable. <laughs> Hell yeah! I've broken the site. Like you can't use Ruby to do this. So that's what makes JavaScript really cool. Except obviously it's not going to save to the right. Yeah. So that brings me to how do we get JavaScript onto our sites that we build? How do we put JavaScript in HTML so that it can be on the browser? Using a script tag or yeah, exactly. So I have an index.html file here. It looks pretty empty right now. Do you guys know the shortcut for making like <coughs> a basic template of HTML? Like, like to HTML type? HTML tab. tab. Okay. And it gives you a basic template. It's, it's also an Atom thing, oh, so too. <laughs> Noise. <laughs> All right, so our page is kind of empty right now. Let's give it an h1. Hello, friends. And if we open index.html, I don't think I saved. Now we can see our stuff. We can give our page a title. Where does the title go? Yeah. Hey, friends. So this is like in the head, we have our metadata. So everything about the website goes there. And we can have this here. So we can put a script tag here. And in between the script tag, we can put some actual JavaScript. Like we can put an alert that says, hello world. And this will run. So now we know that JavaScript is running on our page. It is. It's very simple. Usually you don't really use alerts. Use, I mean, it's kind of... Yeah, but let's just use a console log because then you can see that it actually comes out into your console. So you know that your JavaScript is running and it's working. But the problem is if you have some complex JavaScript that might take a while to run, it could really hang up your site if it's here. So it's going to block everything else from loading, and it's going to be a really bad user experience. So what you could do is technically put it at the end of your body. And it'll still work. But it won't hang up your site, and you'll still have the HTML load. But it's not really good to have scripts that have JavaScript in them. Usually, we link a file. And we can have multiple files of JavaScript and that are just running and doing different things. So how would we link a JavaScript file? SRC. Mm -hmm. So I don't need that script anymore. I can put SRC. And I've already created just an empty index.js file. And I can put that there. And we can put our console log here. Hey friends, just some JS. So let's see if it works. It's working. <coughs> so it's linked up. A lot of the time people still prefer to put this kind of stuff in your head because you don't know like about ordering and how it might matter. Like if you have multiple JavaScript files running and they might depend on one another so a lot of people will still put it in the head, and you might see the word defer sometimes means you're telling your JavaScript to wait. What did I screw up? It's the script under the browser script. Oh. So you're telling your JavaScript to like kind of wait before things are loaded with that word. And another thing you could actually do. Does anyone know what event listeners are? They wait. Yeah. Event listeners not like for like pressing keys and clicks and stuff like that. 
it could be for any event. So I can make an event listener that tells my JavaScript to wait until the HTML is loaded. So an event listener takes two arguments. The first one is going to be what event you are listening for. So it could be like a click, it can be like key up, key down, like mouse enter, mouse leave, like when your mouse hovers <coughs> over something, when it unhovers over something. So if we put um, content loaded, here we're listening for all the content to be loaded on the DOM before we do something. And the second argument that event listener takes is a set of instructions. Like, what do you want to happen when this event is triggered? And what's a good way to provide a set of instructions? Through a function. Exactly, so through a function. So we can literally put a function in here that tells you what to do. So like, ES6 fancy way is like this. Or I still need the curlies actually because I'm not returning. We are in the event listener. <coughs> right here. So now we are in the event listener. So this is like the fancy arrow notation of functions of ES6. How would you just write a basic function that's not as fancy like using the function keyword? Does anyone except Marlin know? <laughs> Dan? Um, I mean, do pretty much the same thing except where it's the uh, empty parentheses instead of function. Mm -hmm. So you don't need the arrow. No, yeah, yeah. And you can just put your console log. <laughs> You can, but you don't have to. So if you don't have a name, it's an anonymous function. It's unnamed. And we use anonymous functions when we just literally want to use a function once and run it once and just throw it away. So we don't really need to name it if we're only going to use it once. I can replace this with that function, and it'll still work. It's just a less fancy way of writing it. If we wanted to name it, we could like on load. It's not taking any arguments. I can give it the same thing. And instead of writing the function in here, I can just put the name of it. And this will still work. So an important thing to notice that's really different for Ruby this is where I'm going to be Prince. Notice. Notice. I'm not actually invoking this function. Does anyone know what it's called when a function takes another function? Is it a callback? Yeah, so the function that is being accepted in as an argument is called a callback. And like you literally cannot do this with Ruby. Like you are passing a function without invoking it. So what the event listener is doing is it's going to decide when to invoke this later. But in Ruby, if you have a function like onload, just saying onload without the parentheses is automatically going to invoke it. So in JavaScript, you can refer to functions without actually invoking them, which is pretty cool. And the other reason that this is working is because of hoisting, because this function is defined after it's used, but it still works. So that's the cool thing that we were talking about, how functions get hoisted to the top. There is one situation where you can write this function in such a way that it won't work. Does anyone know what would break this? OK, so there's two ways to write functions in JavaScript. And I'm talking about like pure ES5. I'm not even talking about like arrow notation or anything. There's using a function keyword. So this is making a function declaration. Your code will run, and it'll see this function word, and it'll hoist it to the top. But you can also save a function in a variable. So like const or var or let, 
and give it the name And so you've declared a function, but you didn't use the function keyword at the top. So this is actually going to break. So let's see what happens. See, uncaught reference error. Is this too small? Should I make this bigger? So that's the whole idea of hoisting. It didn't see the function keyword. This runs before this is even declared, and that's a problem. And we were talking about the var keyword, right? So with var, what happens on the first pass of your program is it'll encounter this var keyword. It'll say, okay, there's, there's a variable here named onload that I need to allocate memory for. So it'll be as if this happens. And when you declare a variable like this without assigning it, it's undefined, and then here it actually becomes defined. So that's what happens with the multiple passes of your program. So even though you have this, it's as if your program first makes the variable undefined, and then when it runs through the program again and it gets to line six, only then it'll be assigned <coughs> to this function. So because it's not assigned yet, and we did it this way, this won't work. And the reason, I don't know how many labs you got through. I got through all of them. It was, it was a long time to get through all of them. But the reason the labs were very much like, don't use var, use const and let, is because if you use const and let, your program will give you an error that like, hey, this thing that you're trying to reference is undefined. But if you use var, it won't give you an error. But onload will just be undefined, and it'll be a silent error, and it'll cause problems. So I just tried to run this, and I'm not being told that there's an error. And that's a problem. So constant let, unless you're really confident in JavaScript and you know what's going on, then you can use var. So there's that. What about selecting like elements on your page? jQuery? Well, we used to teach jQuery here, but now it's not as popular anymore. And it's also just simpler to just use plain JavaScript to select elements. You can use document.querySelector or other things. So does anyone know the syntax for if I wanted to select this h1 element? All right, so we can use document. And query selector can take basically anything. It can take a tag. It can take like a class name or an ID for one of the HTML elements. And it worked. So it's, it's actually selecting this element. So I can use some JavaScript to then do something to this element. Has anyone used it before? Alex? Does it select all, all examples, all functions that you use with the H1? Or is it first one? Very good question. It actually selects only the first one. There's query selector all that can select all of them. So this is bad practice. You should really have just one H1 on a web page. But if I had a second one, and I did query selector H1, it still only selects the first one. Do you know how we would select multiple ones? There's a lot of stuff that you can do. So you can do it with career selector all. You can do it with things like tag name as well. So document basically refers to everything that's on your page. So if I put document and I highlight this, it's like this is the DOM, the document object model, which is basically all of your HTML and everything that's on your page but supposedly represented like an object for JavaScript purposes so that you can, I, I know like I'm saying these things and I'm like, but it doesn't look like an object, but it stands for document object model. It's supposed to be like represented as an object. So that's document and it has all kinds of properties. Like if we try location, 
it tells you where your page is coming from. So we're going to be using document. You can use query selector. You can do things like get elements. I think it's get elements by tag name. And if I give it H1 in this situation, it will select all of them. So if you wanted to do something to all of the H1s, you can use this. You can also use query selector all. So if I do query, forgot my document. It also selects all of them. Now, this looks like an array, right? It looks like an array. Pay attention because you will mess this up. You will mess this up, and I've had to help other Mod 3 students before when they mess this up. This is actually not an array. So it's something called an array-like object. <laughs> How would you check the type of a data in JavaScript? Yeah, trick question. <laughs> type of. <laughs> Checks the type of a data type. So if I give it a number, it's going to return a number. If I give it a string, it's going to return a string. The problem with arrays is that type of, first of all, it doesn't work on arrays, which makes this whole thing much more complicated. What is an array in JavaScript with data type? It's an object, hell yeah. So that doesn't work. So there's actually a special way to check if something is an array. So in JavaScript, there's something called an array prototype, which is where all of your array methods live and things that you can do to arrays. So there's one called isArray. So you do array.isArray, and you pass it the array that you're trying to check. So I'm just going to put in an empty one, and it tells you true. That's an array. So if we wanted to check if this is actually an array, we can do array.isArray. And it tells you false. And you may have to do this if you're trying to select all these elements and you're trying to run some kind of function on them to add some behavior to all of these elements, and it's not working. I would strongly recommend that you check if that's actually an array or if it's an array-like object, because that trips a lot of people up. And the array-like object, is it accessible that you were an object or a hash or whatever? I don't know what that means. Like, like how do you access the data inside of that collection? Like this. Collection? Just the same way you access an array, or would it be mm. like to access a hash? I don't think you can access it any other way except so turning it into an array. So it's okay. not an array, but you access it. Yeah, you can access it like it is an array, but there's a way to do that. There's a way to force it to be an array, and that's array.from. So it's another array method. You will be using this an awful lot. You can also see it has like, usually they have some of the array methods on, but not all of them. You can see it has map yeah. and not select and like that. You can see how so now this looks more like an array. When you see something like this, it doesn't say HTML collection, doesn't say node list. There's a two, there's two elements in this array, and it's actually an array. So in console, we would know which one looks. We could basically tell just by looking at that there. Yeah, you can, but also, if you're not certain, just do array dot is array. Yes? All right, one more question. If you do an array dot cloud node, Mm -hmm. Does it create a new object or does it convert? Like if you make changes to the elements in, in an array that you've created from the radar from, does that change probably back to the I don't think it will change the initial, the original array. This will just give you a way to work with the things that you want to work with. So if I take this array from and I can now check, so I've coerced it into array, but let's just double check that it's an actual array. It's true. Yep. So when we make that new array, I'm not sure if it's the exact same question I was asked, but uh, so in that array, 
the data is getting put into a new object. So it's just, mm -hmm. it doesn't reference, after that it's no longer referencing the first one if you do anything. Okay. I don't think it would be, yeah. So this is just like some complexities of JavaScript. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Greg? If you go up to in your console log, up to where it says underscore protocol underscore. Yeah. Oh, so fun. Where? <laughs> yeah, this. Oh, this just keeps going on and on forever. Yeah, this is the array prototype that tells you all of the methods that you can run on this thing. And if you go to the one above, you can see like it has a couple of those. You know this one. Yeah. yeah. So you can see that four inches there. Yeah, that's a really good thing to point out too. That way you can tell that there's only some things you can run. Yes. Also, when if there's the one underneath it that says off proto object, can you use any of those? So, like, there's also get those. Like, can you um, use all of this? Because it just goes on and on forever, right? Yeah, I don't know, I think so. Let me see. Um, <laughs> let's try. Let me try. Dot has own I think you can. Mm. JavaScript. Is it like you have to use one of the first things on it, and then you can use those? Maybe. But I don't think we should be getting bogged down by this right now. Let's move on to data types. So JavaScript has seven data types. What are they? Yeah. Shout them out. Boolean. Boolean, my favorite. String. String. Number. 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 <laughs> So just objects, oh, really. <laughs> Wait, I want to check now. An array-like object, what would its type of be? It's object. I bet it's object. I mean, it has to be. Not a number. How would you get... So I like to use node because I'm really into JavaScript. This is like the JavaScript version of IRB node. So how, how what would make you get NAN, not a number? Like doing what kind of operation? Um, one plus Q. I don't think that would work. I think that would return a string that's one Q. But if you do something like you divide a number by a string, then you get not a number. And Peter, because of type coercion, JavaScript tries to coerce different types together. So when it sees you trying to add a number with a string, it's going to just turn it into a so string. So it wasn't a string, it was just the letter Q. Like, this, that was I think it's going to say, it's going to tell you a reference error because yeah. there's you Cause didn't define yeah. Q. And then like it coerces Booleans, like for instance, true gets coerced into one. So if you do like zero plus true, you're going to get one. So that's like the type coercion that goes on with JavaScript. Symbol. What? Symbol, yeah. We don't really use symbols much in JavaScript. Unlike Ruby, when you have your hashes and your symbols are the keys in JavaScript, it might look like it's symbols when you're making a JavaScript object. Like if I put Jane, hello. But it's really just a shortcut, and this will still be a string. I'm not 100% sure what symbols are actually used for. I think it's something with storage, and I haven't ever used symbols. If you did a variable with the dollar sign first, or mm -hmm. an underscore, is that considered a symbol, or is it still a string? The only time I've seen the dollar sign, well, other than template literals, where you're trying to interpolate, I've only seen the dollar sign used with jQuery, so I don't think it's going to, yeah? Is a date time an object in JavaScript as well? I have not really used date time, but I would assume it would probably be an object, or there's something similar to date time in JavaScript. Alex? I'm not really sure about this, but is date time defined, or null, rather, separate? Null and undefined. How many do we have now? 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One of these things. So, NAN is one of those two. I don't know which one Actually, I'm confused about it. Hey, just do in the, yeah, no. in the node. Let's Google JavaScript data types <laughs> so we can see which ones are the official ones. How are we doing on time? I didn't know. Yeah. So, now which one is NAN? Undefined and Well, we can do it in the Oh, so not not a number is not actually a data type. It's something that can be returned. Like for instance, infinity can be returned to. Infinity is a number. Yeah. So wait, what is type of? <laughs> yeah, not a number is a number. <laughs> not a number is of type number. All right. Just like infinity is type number. All right, so not a number is a number. Okay. Does anyone know the difference between null and undefined? I think null is Yeah, I was going to say, null is technically defined as like absolutely nothing, whereas undefined is like we have no idea what this is. Yeah, undefined is usually when you just didn't assign something and your program tells you, hey, like this thing is undefined. You never define what it is. Or if you forgot to return in your function, which you probably might do, because you're coming from Ruby where the returns were implicit, then your function will return undefined. But null is used when you actually specifically want to start off something as like an absence of a value, and null usually tells you that a human put it there in your program and not to mess with it. Alex? So like, under, undefined is, is a separate data type. You use it kind of Yes. I frequently use it in if statements. So like the shortcut for if statements, like if some true condition. And if I know a value is undefined and undefined is falsy. So if I put like say I have has eaten or I don't know, some random thing and it hasn't been defined yet, <laughs> then this will be false and my if won't run. So that's like a useful way. Oh, yeah. That you so can use like, undefined. So what was the return? It just will return blank. If you already ran that. I don't know. Or not defined, right? This will this will probably tell me. Oh well, it just yeah has it and it's not defined because it's undefined. So I do type of has eaten. I get undefined. So that brings me to what are well, actually, before that, a few things in JavaScript are objects. Like, multiple things are considered objects. What are they? Arrays. Yeah, arrays are considered objects. Objects. Yeah, plain old objects. Array-like objects. Array-like objects. A hash is an object. What else? There's one more. I think a function. Is an object. <coughs> All functions in JavaScript are objects. All functions are objects. Yeah. But functions are very special that if you actually have a function and you do type of on the function, it will tell you function. Because there's like special things involved. But there's no type of function. It's really an object. Let me see if I forgot any of them. Yeah, functions, objects, arrays. We talked about type coercion. We talked about truthy versus Falsy, difference between null and undefined. How would you check if an array is empty? Wait, let's back up. Let's back up. What are the falsy data types in JavaScript? Hang on. Yeah, there's six of them. So there's false, there's null, undefined. It's a lot more than there is in Ruby. Yeah, exactly. So this annoys me about Ruby that zero is not falsy. In Ruby, it can be annoying. All right, what else? There's two more. Well, let's find out. If we do the bang bang, it tells you this is true. So this is not falsy. An empty something else, though. An empty string, yeah. Well, let's do empty string. 
So this is false. An empty string is a falsy value, but an empty hash, as you call them, they're really objects, is going to give you true. So that's still truthy. So we have one, two, three, four, five. How do you say the word? Six. six. What's the falsy version of a symbol? There's no such thing. I don't no, think. Everything else seems to have a correlation with the data. Let's see what we're missing. Not a number. Yeah. So that was yeah, not a number. What's a number? Not a number is a number, but it's falsy. So it's like zero. Yeah, I don't I don't know. JavaScript is weird, but it's so beautiful. I hope you guys love it as much as I do. So now that we have determined what the falsy values are and we determined that an empty array is not false and neither is an empty object, how would you check that those things are empty? You can. How do you? You want to test it equal to a what? To an empty? Yeah. Oh, this is gonna be fun, guys. Because they're not, they're, not, they're, not, they're not the same reference. They're not the same reference. Yeah. Hold on, you're gonna have to run that by me. I will. I'm gonna cover this point too. This is literally about like everything that trips you up. So you literally have to pay attention to every part of this. So this is gonna be telling you that it's an empty array. And you can do things like this. So you can kind of turn it into a falsy value by doing things like this. Because zero is false, right? So empty dot length, which is zero, and zero is false, it's going to tell you that it's false. So bang bang is looking for truth or falseness? Converting. Yeah, because the bang converts any Boolean into the opposite. Which is great. And the double bang converts it back into what it originally was, so it converts anything into a Boolean. It's like a one. It's true. <laughs> You can. I mean, you can do anything. Yeah, four <laughs> You can. I mean, but is that really productive at that point? All right. So the question is, guys, stay on track. How are you going to check that this is an empty object? So you have to return length the values of it in order to see if it's bang bang dot. Oh, sorry. Is there? So, with empty objects, there's a way to get the keys or the values from that object. So if I have an object called Marlin, name Marlin, Marlin, what's your favorite food? Um, spaghetti. I don't really know how to spell spaghetti, so I'm just going to. That's fine. OK. I love that this is an object, right? <laughs> so remember, there's an object prototype. There's a method on that object called keys. And you can give it any object. Yeah, keys. Whoops. Is this too small? Should I make it bigger? OK. So if you do object.keys and you pass it an object, like Marlin, it's going to return an array of the keys. And I believe you can do that with values as well. So how can we do something like this to determine that an object is empty? So we're trying to an empty object and return an empty array. Yeah. Now these dot length, bang bang, object dot length dot length. Say that again? Or could just be, yeah. Okay. Bang bang, start object dot key, Marlin. OK, so we're going to give it an actual empty one this time. And then dot length. There we go. Because object.keys will return an empty array. Because we've passed it an empty object, there's no keys. Object.keys.length will return zero, and putting the bang bang in front will tell you that it's false. Make sure you pay attention to all of these things. All right, any questions about this so far? Peter? I still really want to go over the fact that values of two empty arrays. That's exactly the next thing that we're going to talk about. So I'm just going to throw this thing in here. Pass by value, pass by reference. 
So in JavaScript, there's something called primitive values, which are like strings, numbers, just like very basic primitive values. And they're stored by their value. But things that are more complex, like objects and arrays, which are technically objects, are stored by their reference in memory. So instead of storing the actual object when you make a variable set to that object, you're just storing a path to where it's stored in memory. So when we do this, it's like we've created two different empty arrays that are two different places in so memory. So it's comparing two instance variables that are technically the same number, but were created at different times. Mm -hmm. So if we do array one, and we do array two, we've created two different arrays. They just both happen to be empty, but they're stored at different locations <coughs> in memory, and array one will not equal array two. But if we make array three, and we actually set it equal to one of these that exists, like array two, now it's actually going to point to the same place in memory as array two. So now array three will actually equal array two, but array one will not equal array three. So it's No, because array array two and three equal each other, so array one still does not equal. Wait, so with arrays is assigned by reference? Yes. Okay. Ah. Mark. So because array uh, three is referencing array two, if I do something to array three, it's gonna point back to array two. And they're both gonna be affected. Gonna be and I like learned this the hard way. Just literally the other day, I was coding something in JavaScript, and I was trying not to mutate an array that was incoming into my function as a parameter, so I made a copy of it. So I had an array, and it was like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? So I was like, I don't want to mutate this array, so I'm going to make a copy of it. So I made an array called copy that was set to array. So I was like, great, now they're two separate things. And then I try to push something into my array. So if I push like six into it, it actually also affects copy. Because they're pointing to the same place in memory. So both are getting mutated at the same time. Or if you do copy dot unshift. Yeah. And actually, actually, like, one of the labs made me think about this again because it talked about how in order to make a copy of an array you can use slice. So if you use, so say we make a third copy and we set it to array.slice. It actually, like slice takes a slice of an array but we're not passing it any arguments. So it's just going to make a copy of the array and in this situation if you mutate third copy, so if I do third copy dot push something, then third copy will now have the thing that I pushed, but whatever I copied from, from array, it's not going to have that thing. So this is something to pay attention to. And this happens with objects as well. So if I have an obj set to, we have Jane me and then we have obj2 and say we also have jane me these are going to be two different places in that memory And then if we were to set obj3 to one of these, then now they will be in the same place of memory. And if you mutate one, it'll mutate the other. Does that make sense, yeah. Peter? But what if I do want to check to see if the values of two different arrays have, like, have the same values? You can do object.values if you wanted to. So it would be other, so it would be array, object.values array one is equal to object.arrays.array2. 
I don't know because it's going to be complicated when two arrays don't technically equal each other. We can try. So like object dot values obj gives me me and then object dot values obj2. So this is, I think it's still going to give you that they're different. Especially because I, I called them different objects and they're stored in different places in memory. So it gets really complex with arrays and objects, but it's not something that we're going to dive in too deeply right now. This is more of like me introducing you to things that will trip you up and that you need to look out for. And then we can figure that out more later. Alex? I'm really sorry. I don't think I'm Oh, forget the unshift. I always forget shift versus unshift. What slice does is it takes a slice of an array. So if I have one, two, three, four, five dot slice, it could take no arguments. So let's name this a ver. There are. It could take no arguments. So I'm not taking any slice of the array. I'm returning that entire slice. So now my R will still be that whole array, but if you wanted to use slice a different way, you can technically do slice. You can say where you want to start slicing. So if I want to start slicing from index 2, so this is 0, 1, 2, it'll give me just 3, 4, 5. So that's how, that's how you can make an object that also creates a new reference. Yes, exactly. <laughs> this is how you copy an array or take a part of it without mutating the original array. You can do, like if you do dot pop, you guys know about dot pop. So if I have there are, so actually pop is gonna return the thing that I popped <coughs> off. So this is not really, okay, never mind. So if I do r dot pop, it's gonna return five, the thing that I popped off. And R is now going to be mutated. But if I wanted to take off the last thing from this array without mutating it, I can use slice. So I can do R dot slice. And the shortcut for taking off just the last thing is negative 1. So it's going to give me just 4. And if I look at R, it didn't actually take the thing off. So this is how you would work with arrays mutating versus non-mutating the array. All right. Are we good on this topic? Can we move on? OK, so in what situation do we use the double equals versus the triple equals? Should we only use one of them? Should we use both of them? Yes. So in JavaScript, there's something called loose comparison, like loosely equal which is the double equals, and then there's something called strictly equals, which is the triple equals. So because of type coercion in JavaScript, how you can technically convert one thing into another, the loose will check if they're like loosely equal. So for instance, the number 42 is loosely equal to the string 42, because you can coerce one type into the other. But this can cause you problems because they're not the same data type that you're working with. So it's much better to use the triple equals. So comparing 42 to 42 will give you false because they're not strictly equals. So really do try to stick with the triple equals, especially because if you use double equals, it might work for half your situations for what you're trying to accomplish, but then break for the other half, and you won't know what's going on, and there will be silent errors. So I suggest you stick with the triple equals. Or things like true can be coerced into one, so this will return true, but true is strictly not one, so that'll be false. Any questions about this part of JavaScript? Okay, let me see what else I need to cover. Accessing values in an object. How would you access values in an object? So if I had an object, one last time. How 
How can I get the value me? There's two ways in JavaScript to access values in an object. What are they? Mm -hmm. So dot is preferable. So obj dot jane will give me the value that I'm looking for. How would you use the bracket notation? So there's brackets involved, and what is it? It has to be a string. And that'll work. If you do it without the string, it's not going to work. It's more like you're referencing a variable. Like when you're trying to iterate through an object, kind of how we iterated through Ruby hashes, and you want to do something for each key, then whatever you named your variable, you would put it without quotes. And you couldn't do that with dot notation. With dot notation, it has to be literally what that thing is called. So that's something to pay attention to. Any questions about? Explain the last part again. This part? Yeah. Using without quotes? Right. So if you were to iterate through an object and like you had a key, then you can use this like a variable name instead of the literal thing that you're trying to pull out about. Yeah, and we can use, we can do that in a REPL. It's probably better. So say I had so person object. This is going to be my object name. What name should we use? Dan. Dan. What else? What other property about Dan? Awesome. True. Okay. And one more. Age. I don't know if he wants to share. Mr. Mystery. Okay, fine. So if we were to iterate through an object, does anyone know how you can do that? It's it's gonna be a for in loop. So like for ver key in object or in person object because we're referring to the literal object that we're trying to iterate through, you can console log the value. So let's console log person object and pass it the key because it's referring this variable is abstractly representing all three of these at once. So that's why we're not using the quotes here. So this will console log all of them one at a time. Does that make sense? Okay. Enough with objects. There was something else I wanted to cover. Why do we use var and const and let? Or like, why do we not want to use var? Uh, we don't want to use var because it won't define the problem that we're error. Yeah. Won't it won't hoist to the top. Yeah. So if we have var bananas equal to bananas, and then we console log bananas, the variable, this will work. We have our bananas. But we switch it. It'll be as if the program is declaring bananas without assigning it to a value, so it's undefined. And then only when it hits this line, it's going to assign it to a value. And when it hits this line, it's just going to think it's undefined, but it's not going to throw an error. And that's going to cause some problems. So it's a silent error. And how can we avoid that from happening? Exactly. So strongly recommend using const for everything, unless you're 100% certain you're going to need to reassign that value later. So just start off using const, and then when you <laughs> discover, oh, I actually need to reassign this value, then you can change it to let. And it makes your program stronger. So now it's actually giving me a real error as opposed to a silent error. I feel like I missed some important thing that I wanted to cover. Okay, read it this. Oh, this is important. So const means that a variable cannot be reassigned, 
but if you set something like an array or an object to const, you can still mutate that thing. And it's not the case in every languages. Like I studied Swift for a weekend once just for fun and I realized <laughs> you can't do that in Swift. Like it won't let you even mutate something. So if I have const, what's an array that we should use? We work. We work, sure. What should we put in our array? Okay, that's enough stuff. So, <laughs> if we try to push something into this array, what do you want to push into it? Fun. Fun. Okay, and we console log we work. This will work. Get rid of these bananas. <laughs> so this will work. I was able to successfully mutate the array. But it's just that we cannot reassign it to a new array. So if we tried to do something like reassign we work to one, two, three, like this will give me an error. Assignment to constant variable. And it's the same thing with objects. Like if we had an object that had keys and values, you can write a new key value pair into that object or reassign one of the key value pairs inside of that object. You just can't reassign that variable to a brand new object. Does anyone have questions about that or need to see an example? Unless we use let. Unless you use let. Thank you. Exactly. Steven. You can use slice because that's not even like it's just non-mutatingly making a copy. So there's a way to mutatingly do things to an array, and that's splice. I'm actually kind of bad at using splice because it's really bad to mutate your work and like arrays and stuff. So I haven't used splice as much, but I believe it would work because you're mutating it. You're not reassigning it to a brand new thing. Okay. Anything else before we move on? Okay, now we're going to talk about scope. What do you guys know about scope? Marlon? It's like um, how you can access stuff for mm -hmm. like the blocks. Mm -hmm. Like if there is a const inside of a function, I mean, this scope isn't really defined in JavaScript, right? Totally. Like you can't access stuff outside of the function. You can access stuff above you. Yeah, but but you're supposed to like not. Well, you're not supposed to leave global variables just hanging out globally. But this is actually something that really surprised me about Ruby, that you can't just pull in a global variable into your method. Everything is just defined to the local scope. But in JavaScript, that's not the case. So if I have const apples equal to apples, and then I have a function, see my apples, I can console log apples. And this is in the scope above me. It's the, the, the variable apples. Oh, yeah. Good point, because that won't show the point I'm trying to make. <laughs> It'll just look like it's working, right? So let's invoke see my apples. So now, Let's get rid of this WeWork stuff. Now if I'm here, I can see apples. If I have, did you guys learn about the scope chain? Really cool stuff in JavaScript. Do you know about Russian nesting dolls? Yeah. Matryoshki, they're called. What are they called? Matryoshki. So it's all about like, the parent scope because in, <laughs> in JavaScript you can have functions inside of functions inside of functions inside of functions and the innermost function will be able to access all of the variables up its scope chain and like every function that's above it but a function above it won't be able to access something in the innermost function and the way that a function looks for a variable is it goes up the scope chain. So first it'll check inside of its local scope. Is there a variable called this 
that's in my local scope. And if it's not, then it's going to go up to a higher scope. So if I had const apples in here too, and I called it bananas, I set it equal to bananas, and I'm const logging apples, this function will first check inside its own scope before moving up a scope. So it's going to resolve this to bananas. So if we look at that. Bananas. Dan? So if we console log outside of the function, will it still be bananas or apples? If we console log outside of the function, it'll be apples. And a good rule of thumb, like you use console log a lot for debugging, but when you start console logging a lot of things, you don't know what's what. So label your arguments. What will this console log? Because console log can take as many parameters as you want, separated by commas. So this is just labeling my argument for me. Why didn't it? Wait, oh, see my apples. Not this. Oh, there it is. So it's it's the apples that's in global scope. <laughs> Peter? So that means that you can name a multiple constants the same thing, even though they're technically different. You can. You can. But you can also do this. You can reassign. It's the, sorry, it's the, what we're calling it is the type to make sure that I'm. If you think about like the life cycle of a connected cat, yeah, and that's, and that's what I'm trying because because like doing the constant mm -hmm. of like all caps in Ruby is completely different than just doing the, that, that's that's what I'm trying to make sure I'm comprehending. Yeah, so you can actually if you don't use const using const here declares another variable that can't be changed. That's called apples. If I don't do this, what's going to happen? Well, no. You're going to reassign this apples to bananas, and it's going to console log out bananas. So this should log bananas. And then this code happens after all of this runs, so after the fact that this was changed to bananas. So this will also console log out bananas. Oh, yeah, it wouldn't work. Yeah, that wouldn't work. So it would only work with like. So. Oh, so this this should log bananas is logging apples. No, this should log bananas is logging bananas. Is logging bananas. What will this console log? Right. Is logging apples. So it's only reference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so it can get complicated with scope because you can have functions inside of functions. Like this function can return another function, which is why JavaScript is a functional language. So say we return another function. I was just name all of these different things. Oranges. So we'll console log our bananas. So this innermost function, well actually let's just have it return something. It can have access to everything in here. And then this function has access to everything in here. And then this function has access to what's outside of it. So actually what's going to happen if we console log our see my apples function? Notice, notice, we're not invoking it. What should we console log? What are we gonna see? Let me label it see my apples. Yeah, because in JavaScript, you don't have to invoke a function. So we're seeing the whole function. Isn't that cool? And if we invoke it, what are we going to see? 
What is what is see my apples return? It returns the function. Let's see. Why is this happening? Because we're just calling that function without, or we're just yeah, we're not calling to do that. Yeah. So in this situation, we're getting the return value, which is another function, but we're not calling that other function. Cool stuff with JavaScript. If you wanted to invoke that other function, you got to use your invocation parentheses again, and only then will you return bananas. <laughs> so this is, this is some cool stuff in JavaScript. This trips me up for a long time that sometimes people will assign a variable to like the inner function. So you might have something like const, so we're in oranges now, is equal to see my apples invoked. So this is really now set to this function. And then they will invoke this function because it's set to a function that can be invoked. And this tripped me up for a really long time. So now we should see bananas. So you can invoke a variable because that variable is set to a function that can be invoked. Fun stuff in JavaScript. So that's the same way that like you create like multiple levels of functions in Ruby that end up just displaying like one simple phrase. It would just be creating new constants that are just invoking functions. Yeah, I don't even know if there's a Ruby equivalent for this. Ruby is like very about blocks. And JavaScript is very much about functions. And that's another thing. We can talk about blocks. I took some notes about this too. So how does var versus let and const compare when it comes to blocks? Does anyone know what I'm even talking about right now? Anthony knows. Anthony's so happy right now. <laughs> uh, I think let is blocks. Mm -hmm. So, and scope. exactly. Yeah. Ver is still function scopes, though. So if I use the word ver in one of these functions, like, I cannot just call this from outside. That won't work. It's This variable is trapped inside of this function and can only be seen here. But, yes, Marlon? Oh, I was, was going to say what you're about to say. Yeah. But... If you have a block and anything, a block can be a for loop because it's something surrounded by curly braces or it can be an if statement. So if I do something like if one equals one, this will always be true, so this will run. And I use the word let or if I use the word const, this will be trapped inside of this block. And I will not be able to console log i from outside. So if I label this, I'm trying to console log i, it's saying i is not defined. Because this right here, curly braces, are a block. If I use var, it's not block scoped. So I will still be able to access var from outside. And I can see that i is 0. But just notice that this isn't a function. Like if this was a function, like this, and it was inside the curly braces of a function, there was a var, then you couldn't access it from outside. So block scope and function scope are a little bit different. Is everyone OK with that concept? And you can, you can do that with for loops, too, like for. So con is const is also block scoped so I could not access I from outside of this block and so you can do the same thing with the for so this is how you would loop through some random array or a string or anything you want so in this situation I'm just looping until my I becomes 5 if I want to console log, lol. And then I want to take this out and I want to see what i is from outside. I'll be able to see that i is 5 because I'm using var. 
but if I use the word let, I will not be able to access I outside of it. Yeah. Well, const would not even work here because I'm trying to increment, I'm trying to reassign it every time, so const would actually just completely break assignment to constant variable. So is everyone okay with this block scope concept? Yeah, one thing I actually forgot to mention when I was talking about all of this crazy stuff about how like primitives are stored by their value in Ruby, you can actually reassign characters of a string. Do you ever notice that? But in JavaScript, you cannot, because primitive values cannot be mutated. They can only be reassigned. So for instance, if I open an IRB, and I make a variable called string, that's set to a string that's string, and I try to reassign string of zero, so I'm trying to reassign s to something else like x. In Ruby, this actually works. But in JavaScript, this will not work. And that's because of the whole primitive values thing. Like you can reassign things like numbers and strings, but you can't mutate them. You can only mutate objects and arrays. So if I had var string is equal to string, and then I try to reassign string of 0 to x. It doesn't tell me that anything is wrong, but it just will not mutate strings. And that's another thing to pay attention to. You will mess this up if you ever try to use it. Yes, Marlon? Um, so can you iterate through strings? In JavaScript, you can iterate through strings very easily. So if I had, what should we make our string? Marlin, you can just iterate how would we console log each character do you know well i is the number so this is something that might trip some students up string, string bracket. yeah so actually i is not related to this string at all. We just literally set i from 0 to be less than the string of length. So we're using numbers that will match indexes that exist in this string, but they're totally two separate things. We're just manipulating it in such a way that it works for us. So this is how you would um, iterate through a string. So let's see. Assignment to const variable. This trash, gotta go, gotta go. So now we were able to print all of this out. Any questions? I'm trying to see what else I need to cover with you guys. So functions are objects. Functions are objects. They have properties. So if I wrote a function what should I name my function? <coughs> Anthony. Anthony? What should our function return? I love <laughs> well, we know the real truth, so. <laughs> I love JS. So let's invoke Anthony. We get this, right? So, Anthony. Ay, ay, ay. Is a function. <laughs> You can call different properties on it. You can see dot name, and it'll return the name of the function. You can do dot length, and you can see the parameters that it's called with. That's what dot length is. So if you had a function that had like an x, y, like it takes in an x, y, and adds them together, then the dot length would be 2. So there's different properties that you can do on your function. And if I had an anonymous function, so how would I write an anonymous function again? So the function return something here. What am I missing? 
unexpected. Let's do ES6. All right. So this, even though it's anonymous, it has no name. You can still read properties off it if you wanted to. So what would its dot name be? It'd be an empty string because it doesn't have a name. But it's close enough because an empty string is a falsy value. And then the other thing that we can cover very briefly, there's something called iffy an immediately invoked function expression. So this is the opposite of a callback. So if you remember a callback, a function takes a function. It takes a callback and it decides what to do with it, when to invoke it. In the situation of an event listener, it'll evo invoke that function when the event is triggered. The iffy is kind of an opposite kind of thing. You write your function and you invoke it immediately. So it's very, very rare that you would use this, but it's good to have exposure to it anyway. So if I had my anonymous function, I can invoke it right away as I write it, and it'll return something. If I had an anonymous function that takes two values, like x and y, and it returns the sum, x plus y. So I have to wrap the whole thing in parentheses so I can work on it like as a single unit, and then I can invoke it with real arguments, literally as I wrote it. You can't do that with Ruby. You can't just write def and put your function and invoke it immediately, but you can in JavaScript. So. That's some other cool stuff you could do. Um, I mean, that covers most of the complex stuff. Higher order functions is like when functions take functions, which is what we got through with callbacks. I do think it's important for you guys to really understand how map and filter work in JavaScript, because it's kind of different from map and select in Ruby. So I do want to like take five minutes to go over that. So if I wanted to <coughs> transform an array, so I have like const, I don't, I don't know if this will work. I don't want to mess this up, so I'll just be safe. So we have an array. What if I wanted to transform this array so that every number is two higher than itself? How would I do that with math in JavaScript? So it's, it's like the map method in Ruby. It's an array method. But in Ruby, you have your dot map, and it takes a block, and it gives you, this is the element that I'm looking for. This is what I want to do to each element. I'm looking through this element one at a time. I'm adding two to each one as I iterate through it, and in the end, I'm returning a new array that's transformed. In JavaScript, this is very important because it looks different. The syntax is kind of wonky. Does anyone know what you need to do to use a map in JavaScript? No? OK. Dot map takes a function. So it takes a callback. So we can write a function, and that function takes each element one at a time. So that's where you could write your representation of what are we going to call this variable. We're going to call it x. And then we want to return x plus 2. It's not too hard, but it's just like, whoa, that looks really weird. Yes, Marlon? Is that where people even do? In that situation, would you still use the arrow syntax? Yeah, and actually the arrow syntax would be better in this situation. And you can also just have your, just to prove a point, you can have your adder function out here. And you can do x plus 2. 
and then you can literally just pass it. No, go away. Stop! Because it takes a function, right? It doesn't invoke that function, it just takes a set of instructions of what should I do. So let's see. Let's console log the result of this and see if it worked this way. Results of mapping. Now what? Oh, I think it doesn't like that I tried to use Ruby. This is what happens when I try to show you guys things that don't work in JavaScript because mm -hmm. then it breaks. Ugh, I guess I didn't do this right. But normally, you wouldn't have your function on the outside. You would put your function here. Well, you would return what you want each thing to do. So like x plus 2. Did I not? Is that what the problem was? That could be what the problem was. Yeah. So you give it a function, and you can do it like this. Or you can use the arrow syntax. So arrow syntax, instead of function, we just use this. And then an arrow. If there's one argument, you put an argument. And the cool thing is you don't need the, you actually don't need parentheses if your function takes only one argument. If your function takes more than one argument, you need the parentheses. And if your function takes no arguments, you need the parentheses. So we can write this as an arrow function. So it takes one argument. I technically don't need the parentheses. And then I can do my return x plus 2, and this will still work. And then the other thing about arrow syntax, and I really think the developers are trying to make JavaScript more like Ruby, because it's like the popular thing this way, this these days, and like the Ruby developers are probably like, oh, we can't deal with JavaScript. Well, too bad. But anyways, you can do it in one line with arrow functions if you know that you're just going to have a one line function that returns one thing like this x plus 2. You can take out the return, and you can take out the curlies, and this will work, and it looks visually appealing, and it's a little bit more like Ruby. And then, what about filter? What if I want to filter this array to only be numbers greater than 3? How do I do that? <coughs> yes, and it also takes a function. So what will we do? X arrow. Mm -hmm. X, uh, right. So it, we need to return a boolean, and so it's going to go through every element inside the array because X represents each element one at a time, and it's going to check is this condition true for that element, and if it is, it's only going to return those elements in the array. So if we console log js filter, now we got our numbers that are greater than 2. And I mean, that's about all of the things I wanted to cover with you guys today. You will be working with a lot of JavaScript. You'll be working in Mocha. That's like the testing suite. So reading tests is going to be a little bit different and maybe a little bit more complex. The other thing is, remember that Mocha runs in the browser. So what that means, let me just pull up a JavaScript, one of the labs that we did this weekend. Which one should we go into? So if you do learn. Remember that it opens your tests in the browser, and you can 
debug in here. You can also, as you're writing your code, if you have any problems, you can just throw a debugger in there and it'll stop the execution of your code. And you can, it's kind of like binding.pry, so you'll probably want to learn how to use debugger. And so inside of sources, you'll see everything. You can highlight over variables and see what they are at different points in time. If you use the step, it steps through your function one line at a time. And you can still console log or just print out variables and what they are like you would in binding.pry or binding.pry and see what those things are. So that's how you would use debugger. If you don't feel like using debugger, you can just put console logs instead at different points as long as you like label your arguments so you know what it's referring to. So just some tips on debugging. Anything else? Any questions? Any concerns? Any fears? Excitements? I'm concerned that all this comparison stuff Like the triple equals, or? The fact that if we look at two things that have the same value, like that's going to bother you a lot. It's definitely need to be aware of something to be aware of. It is something to be aware of, but it's not going to be as concerning as you think. Like, I haven't really had to deal with it that much. There's more things that are tagged with policy, which is also aware of for sure. Mm. We're also going to, like, if you deal with objects in JavaScript, like hashes then you wouldn't necessarily be checking if two hashes are equal to each other. You would more be checking, like, does this value exist in this hash? So if you know that you have an object and it has Jane in it. Sorry, I realize this is too small. <coughs> so if you wanted to, like, check if something is in it, you can use an if condition and you can do, well, you wouldn't have to use the double bang because your if this thing would tr is true would check for you. So you can do obj jane and it'll, it'll know if there's a value there. You just have to be careful if it's set to zero. What if I was trying to like, just check to see the equivalence of object jane? Hmm? What if I was trying to check to see if Jane is equal to me, the string me? Like the key? Right, yeah, that's it. Yeah. You could check that. If you know that there's one key, you can use object.keys and compare it to object.values. Because strings are both primitives and stored as um, By value. values. You yeah, can you can compare strings so very easily. Um, object Jane triple equals to string me, would that return true or false? Well, like calling so RBJ equal to me, this would be false. Or no, no, call it, 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 it says the bang bang object. object. At the, it just, uh, the, the, you have the bang bang operator name is object Jane. Tell me what to type. OBJ <laughs> bracket quote Jane and quote end bracket. Equal string me. It's not. Oh yeah, this would be equal. Yeah. Okay. Because you're checking the value. <coughs> Actually, there's a trick with <coughs> objects where I think you can use to string on an object to force it into a string, and then you can check if two objects are equal. Okay. So I think I'm not sure if this is going to work, but if I have Jane me like this, a second object obj1 does not equal obj2 or obj does not equal obj2 but if I do obj.2 string obj2.2 string because you force them into a string and strings can be compared all right I think that's enough for today awesome. enjoy your lab